When we say the name Mary Tudor, many automatically assume that we are referring to Mary I, otherwise known as Bloody Mary. There was, in fact, another Mary, sister to King Henry VIII and Queen of France through her marriage to King Louis XII. In the late 1514, Mary Tudor was sent to France to marry the elderly King Louis. The French court was ahead of its time and French fashion was becoming something of a trendsetter. Mary was spoilt by her husband and she is believed to have carried out her duties as a wife to the French king and Princess of England to a high standard. She is thought to have made her husband very happy as he is noted as saying that he could sufficiently praise and express his delight in her, but this marriage didn't actually last long. For after three months, King Louis passed away. On the 1st of January 1515, at just the age of 52. From a terrible case of gout. As was the custom after a king's death, Mary was required to stay in France for around six weeks, away from all men to ensure that she was not pregnant with the king's child and heir. Mary was kept at the Palace de Cluny until it was deemed that she was not pregnant. The newly appointed Duke of Suffolk, Charles Brandon, was then sent to France so that he could escort Mary back to England, but Charles and Mary had a history in a sense. She loved him and he her, and she never actually wanted to marry the French king. Being the sister of the king, Mary had to abide by the wishes of Henry VIII. Henry was aware that Mary did not want to marry King Louis, and he agreed to Mary's proposal that if her husband, the French king, died and she outlived him, then she would happily marry him if it meant that she could then remarry for love. Henry agreed, but if he actually meant it, well, that's another story. It's thought he only agreed to get his sister to go to France and ensure his own agenda was fulfilled. It's interesting because we have copies of letters that were sent from Mary to her brother, where she talks about her love for Charles and her brother's promise. Another interesting point is that Mary actually discussed her wishes to marry Charles with the new French king, Francis I, when he asked her if she ever made a promise of marriage, and she replied that she wished to marry the Duke of Suffolk, and Francis is believed to have encouraged this. It's also believed that some letters were sent from Calais, as Mary and Charles made their way back to England. She spoke about how she, not Charles, had the idea, and that she set her mind to do it, so she did it, marrying Charles, that is. Mary and Charles married on the 3rd of March, 1515, at the Hotel de Cluny in Paris, with ten people present, one being King Francis I. Technically, this was treason. Charles had married a royal princess without the king's consent. When Henry VIII sent his friend to France to escort Mary back, he made Charles promise he would not marry his sister, also mentioned in the letter that was written. Henry knew how much Mary liked Charles and must have recalled the promise he had made his sister. He was undoubtedly outraged, and it is believed that his privy council urged that he have Charles imprisoned or executed, and Mary being the king's sister, well, she was safe from that herself. Mary, in her next letter, speaks of how she trusted her brother's promise to be true, and how she still believes that he will do good on his word and blessing, and bless the marriage between Mary and Charles, appearing to his brotherly love for her. I believe the reason that Henry VIII was so upset with his sister remarrying without his consent was because of one simple reason. He wanted to use her as a pawn to make another alliance that would be to his own advantage. The King's Council was also interestingly opposed to the match because they did not want to see Charles Brandon gain any more power at court. Now, instead of Charles or Mary being reprimanded through imprisonment or execution, they were given a large fine of £24,000 which was to be paid to the King in yearly instalments of £1,000 as well as the whole of Mary's dowry from King Louis XII of £200,000, and the gold, plate and jewels King Louis had given or promised her. The £24,000 approximately is equivalent to £7,200,000 today, and was later reduced by the King. 
Mary and Charles then officially married at Greenwich Palace in the presence of the King and his courtiers on the 13th of May 1515, and in 1528 Charles secured legitimacy for his marriage to Mary from Hope Clement VII. Mary was Charles Brandon's third wife, and he had two daughters, Anne and Mary, by his second marriage to Anne Brown, who had died in 1511. Mary raised the girls with her own children. Even after her second marriage, Mary was normally referred to at the English court as the Queen of France, and was not known as the Duchess of Suffolk in her lifetime, despite being legally allowed to be. Now Mary had to fight for what she had been promised, a marriage for love, and she held her brother accountable for the promises that he had made, whether he was a king or not. Her life is remarkable, and her story doesn't end here. Now, it is remarkable to think that Mary stood up to Henry VIII and essentially won. That in itself is a very great achievement made by a remarkable lady. But, as stated, this is not the end of Mary's story. She went on to have four children with Charles, with only two surviving childhood. These were two girls, Frances and Eleanor. Mary was normally referred to at the English court as the French Queen, and at the age of 37, at West Thorpe Hall in Suffolk, on the 25th of June 1533, having never fully recovered from the sweating sickness that she caught in 1528, Mary died. Her funeral was very grand, and her body lay in state at West Thorpe, with candles burning day and night. On the 10th of July, Henry VIII ordered a requiem mass to be held for his sister at Westminster Abbey. Mary was greatly loved by the people of Suffolk, and after her funeral, arms of meat, drink and money were given to the poor. But as was custom, neither Mary's brother, Henry VIII, or her husband, Charles Brandon, attended the funeral. Now, sadly for Mary, she was not left alone for her peaceful slumber. Mary was buried first in the Abbey of St Edmund on July 21st, 1533, and then, just five years later, she was moved to St Mary's Church in Bury St Edmunds. Mary then lay for 250 years, but in 1784 her remains were disinterred. This is because her altar monument was removed because it obstructed the approach to the rails of the communion table. She was reburied in sanctuary, where she rests today, and a pre-Reformation altar stone with five consecration crosses engraved Mary, Queen of France, 1533, was then placed above her grave. Now, when Mary's remains were disinterred and her coffin was opened, it was noted that her body lay in a lead coffin and she was on a plank and had been embalmed and was wrapped in a coarse linen. She still had her long reddish and golden hair as well. Mary's hair was recorded as being nearly two foot long and several locks were trimmed off by Horace Walpole, Dorothy Bentick, Duchess of Portland and several others. A few snippets were taken of Mary's hair and one of these, placed into a locket, eventually made its way to Mosai Hall Museum. Now interestingly, attempts have been made with Mary's hair and the DNA that is contained to try and solve the mysteries of the princes in the tower. Now it is entirely possible to extract the DNA required because Mary Tudor, the Queen of France, will have shared DNA with the princes through mother Elizabeth of York and grandmother Elizabeth Woodville. Now attempts have been made to try and analyse the hair by a specialist in Belgium, but sadly it's believed that these were inconclusive due to the hair being contaminated at some point since their removal. Although there is a research in progress that aims to solve the issue of how to clean contaminated DNA, we may, with some luck in the future, find that Mary Tudor, the Queen of France, can help to solve one of history's biggest mysteries. Thank you for watching, and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.